I will call to order the second monthly meeting of the Hendersonville City Council, August 24th, 2022. Um, we have one item on a consent agenda. Um, does anyone have any questions or comments about the budget amendments? If not, a motion to approve the items on the consent agenda. The motion that's printed there is not the one we need. But oh, I think I, you can figure yes. it out. Madam Mayor, I motion to approve the consent agenda. Okay. Is there any discussion? Those in favor of approving the uh, uh, one item on the consent agenda, say aye. 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 Those opposed say no. Ayes have it. And that way you didn't have to read all those numbers. <laughs> We have a couple presentations, uh, or a presentation, and then some business. Uh, proposed parking rates and fees. <clears throat> All right, Madam Mayor, members of City Council, this is your August 24th update on our new parking management uh, system and program. And it's a, a great time to do it. Our parking deck is looking really good right now. Uh, I've been pretty impressed with how fast it's gone up and, and the appearance of it. So uh, definitely very excited and excited to continue kind of piecing through all the different aspects of what a parking management program looks like and hopefully get some additional guidance today as we move towards that uh, December council action on adoption of rates and fees. As we always want to remember, uh, you can only have two of the three things for parking management. They can be convenient and available, free and convenient, or available and free. Um, and that has been guiding kind of how we've moved through parking uh, development here with our new program. So today uh, we'll talk through permit logistics. Uh, that's the biggest piece we'll want to cover today. Uh, get the public aware, the council aware and briefed on the proposed uh, permit structures that we're going to have in our different surface lots and deck. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the deck logistics, parking enforcement, and park mobile. These will be just kind of subsidiary items that we just want to make the public and council aware of, but we're really looking for direction and comfort in permit logistics. Um, one thing to keep in mind with all of this is, is we're doing this in a way that we can adjust as we go, right? We want to give the information out, allow time for feedback, and then adjust as we see necessary. And I also just want to thank uh, John and Jamie for carrying that torch uh, while I was out last week. So uh, glad to be back and excited to talk about parking again. Um, <laughs> so our current uh, our current permit structure. <laughs> something excited wrong. about talking about parking. Wow. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of like the fire chief gets excited about fires, I guess. <laughs> um, so uh, our current structure, uh, so we currently have five permit locations uh, in our surface lots, and we have six permit options really under kind of three major categories that vary from interior to exterior permits. Uh, the next two points I want to highlight because I wanted a, a capacity to compare apples to apples as we move forward because what we're talking about here is managed inventory of parking spaces. So we'll, we'll have our real inventory, that's each physical space that we have in our parking inventory. And then we'll also have uh, kind of how you manage the parking inventory that you have. So in dedicated permit lots, uh, you can sell best practice 120% of your inventory. So if it's just people can go in with a permit, you can oversell that from a best practice standpoint at 120%. We want to use that, you know, we'll toggle that as we see fit for our community, but for comparison sakes, we want to see before and after, so we're using that as our baseline. Uh, additionally, mixed permit and meters, uh, so a lot where someone could go in and they can park with their permit, but it's also shared with folks who are parking there paying the meter, uh, you would sell about 80% of the inventory as permits. So those are our best practice guidelines that we're going to use in this comparison moving forward. So using that logic, our current <clears throat> capacity for permits is 170 total permits that we could sell today. Right now we've sold about 220 permits, so you can see like when we look at things and how uh, it's actually being used, we're going to adjust accordingly and we're going to do that with the new system as well. But again, for comparisons, we want to have a baseline. 
Uh, this is the current permit structure. You can see the G's, the R's, and the S permits, and they both have an exterior and an interior component to them. The most expensive <coughs> being the G interior permit, $40 per month. That is uh, your spot reserved 24-7. Uh, you park in that same spot all the time. Uh, to the opposite end of the spectrum, the S exterior permit is essentially the dogwood lot at $10 per month, uh, and that's just eight to six any spot in a certain bank of parking spaces. And the R permit is somewhere in the middle. It is your um, reserved space in a bank of spaces, but it's not one single space. Could, could you define interior and exterior so people understand? What yeah, absolutely. So, and we can definitely highlight that on the map too. Interior lots are gonna be interior to the district. So between King and Church Street and Allen and 7th, is that fair? And then anything outside of that uh, downtown district will be our exterior lots. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is just a, a graphic of our current setup. Uh, blue right now are our current reserved lots. So for example, you can see the Apple lot on the top. That's uh, currently a 24-7 lot. 36 of those are reserved 24-7 G permits and R permits with two handicap spaces and eight other spaces for employee parking. Uh, Maple Lot is an example of a fully metered lot. There's 27 metered spaces with two handicap, and then you've got the annex, Maple Annex in the blue up above with 10 reserved 24-7 spaces. Um, going down the list, Spruce is a 16 space reserved 24-7 lot. Azalea is a little more complex. There are some spaces that are unavailable that are privately managed in that lot, and you can see those in the red. Uh, you have five handicap, 44 metered, and four 15 minute 22 reserved. Those 22 and four, the 26 total are unavailable. And then lastly, our largest lot, you have dogwood, which is four handicap spaces, 59 metered spaces, which is in the green area of that lot. You pay the kiosk to park in those spaces. And two sets of, that should be, yeah, 54, so that's over, oversold meters, 50, or oversold permits, 54 reserved, 24 seven on the far left over here and then 54 reserved, eight to six uh, S permits exterior in here. So that's our a, current can inventory. Ask, yeah, can I ask a question um, about the Azalea lot? Yes. Um, those are the only ones that say unavailable beside them? Yes. And I know the spots you're talking about, why are they unavailable? Uh, contractual. Oh, my fault, I remember now, in. never mind. Okay. Many years ago, I remember, yep, never yeah, mind. We got do it, not have it. access to those yeah, yeah. spaces. Got it, got it, got it, I remember. I'll just leave it at that. Is Azalea um, a 27, uh, 24 7 lot as well? Azalea is predominantly metered, so 44 mm -hmm. of those spaces are metered. And then uh, there's 22 reserved right now, permit spaces. And those are reserved 8 to 6, so after 6 p.m., that's our enforcement hours. After, eight, after 6 p.m., uh, those are open to the public. So moving forward, what we're proposing from a permit perspective, and, and remember this is open to change, um, but we were looking at this from a perspective of providing metered locations, but also trying to provide space for additional permits uh, for residents and employees, and then anyone who might want a, a permit interior to uh, the Main Street corridor. Uh, so we'll have six permit locations that will include the new parking deck, three permit options, so trying to consolidate and simplify the permit options a little bit. Again, the same rules applying at 120% uh, for dedicated permit lots and 80% for mixed meters and permits uh, for sale of permits. And so lastly, our proposed capacity would be 213 permits uh, in the existing lots. And when you add the deck in, sold at 80% of the total capacity, you add another 197 permits that would be available, bringing our total to 410 permits that we could sell under this managed inventory approach. The permit structure for cost would be the deck being the premium asset would be $80 per month uh, for a spot in the covered parking deck. Uh, the interior permits, so Apple, Azalea, Spruce, Maple Annex, those would be sold at $60 per month. And then an employee and resident permit to be located in the Dogwood lot at $25 per month. On this image, you can see kind of where those interior lots are in the blue, the deck in the purple, and the employee resident in the orange. 
and additionally, we, want, we wanted to show where metered parking would be, and I'm gonna explain kind of some of our proposed mixed lot uh, scenarios on the next slide so you can see. Uh, we'll have around 425 total metered spaces on uh, Main Street and the avenues, and then you also add another 400 or so uh, within these uh, permit, or not permit, these surface lot areas and the parking deck. So we're gonna break that down in one second. So under our proposal, we've targeted some lots uh, to be mixed lots, so we would sell those at 80% permit capacity, and then we'd also provide metered spaces in those lots as well. Um, and those are all in orange, so you would see the Dogwood uh, employee resident lot labeled with an E, that would be a mixed lot. Uh, in that lot, we would sell 120 E permits under the scenario, and then you'd still have 149 potential meters to park at. Uh, under the deck, it would also be a mixed uh, mixed use asset. You'd have 246 meters, uh, seven of those being handicap, and you could sell about 197 deck permits or D permits. And then lastly, on the right side of the screen, you have your interior lots, and uh, we jo chose just based on location and use um, that the Apple lot would be a permit only lot, so you could sell 120% of those total inventory, so 36 I permits in that lot. Maintain Maple as a metered lot, uh, 27 meters, and then the uh, Annex as a um, interior permit lot, so 10 I permits. We would sell Spruce lot as a mixed use lot based on the use today. Um, so that would be 14 additional meters to park at with an additional 11 I permits. And lastly, we would sell Azalea also as a mixed lot, so 46 meters and an additional 36 I permits. And what you would be able to do with an I permit is park in any of these lots. So you could park in Azalea, you could park in Spruce, Maple Annex, or Apple lot with an I permit. I'm going to pause here for one second. Any questions on uh, this map? I know there's a lot going on. Okay. So um, just looking at the proposals side by side from an inventory management perspective, you can see under that new proposal, um, we're moving to 236 total meters uh, plus 246 deck meters, and then that 410 permit total with the deck and permits. So bringing our total managed inventory to 892 total spaces that we're managing from meters and permits. Uh, that's a 172% total usage of our real inventory, which is 520 spaces after uh, the deck is built. You can see the current, uh, we would have 130 meters, 170 permits, and we're util utilizing about 110% of the real inventory of 274 spaces. So under this proposal, we would be arguably managing our inventory better uh, to provide more spaces based on what's actually on the ground. This just wanted to show side by side the current permit structure and the proposed permit structure so you can see the G permits, uh, the most expensive under the current structure. Uh, you could get a deck permit under this structure for $80 per month and have a space in the deck, uh, so on and so forth down the line there. And lastly, so availability of those permits, we would have 197 deck permits to offer for sale to the public. 93 I permits, so any of those interior lots along the right side of Main Street, and 120 potential uh, employee resident permits or E permits. Um, again, this is something that we would take into account what we're actually seeing, and we might oversell even more if, if it makes sense. So there's time to kind of adjust these types of things. But those are the real numbers. Those the are actual. the best practice percentage. Based on those percentages. Oh, the, those, like, so that's the 120% numbers? Yes. Okay. Yep, the mix of what we proposed on right. the map, mm -hmm. that's what we would get to sell. But in reality, I think there's some where we could probably sell more than the 120%, so. <clears throat> um, lastly, I just included these just to show by lot the current scenario of total meters, permits, handicap spaces, and other spaces. Um, and you can see the total of 347 managed inventory spots for the current structure. And then you can see the proposed structure with the deck totaling 944. To note, just by that change in the way we manage the inventory, you can see the change from 347 to 494 
So really just changing our current asset without the deck, we would be improving our potential sale of permits and meters. And then this, yes, ma'am. Question about the handicap spaces. Yes. Are they, oh, thank you. Are they currently filled most of the time? That's a good question. I don't have any general consensus on that. I mean, I know the Maple lot across the street from City Hall gets decent use. I've seen, you know, some folks parking in there. Um, I don't know about Azalea or Dogwood. Dogwood I, it seems pretty empty. Yeah, I, I think the Main Street handicap do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and I would venture to guess if you just, this is anecdotally, but I would think the way the Maple lot across from us stays pretty full, that a lot of the handicaps yeah, handicap probably are being use, utilized. Yeah. The only ones that may not be the ones over in dog, if there are even, I don't even know if there's any in Dogwood. Dogwood's got four and they're kind of tucked along uh, the yeah. front yeah. edge yeah. here, I yeah. think. Yeah. So yeah, whoever parks there has to come down through the drive and then up yeah. forth if they're coming to Main Street. Um, and then yeah, Azalea, I'm not too sure. It's, I guess so it's split, right? There's there's a couple up on fourth, right? And then there's a couple mm -hmm. down on third, right in here, I think. Okay. Um, someone told me that if you park in a handicapped spot, you don't have to pay for parking. <clears throat> is that correct? Yeah, I believe that is correct, but I do want to check <clears throat> with the ordinance. Yeah, that is correct. Why? <laughs> That's a good question. I mean, if it's in, a, I understand if it's on Main Street yeah. now. But if it's in a lot, it's still you're parking in that lot. Right. Is there a law about that? Yes, that would be in our ordinance. I guess that would define that, right, Chief? Yeah. No, normally, handicap. You know, with the placard, handicap spaces have generally not been. Uh, you know, there's generally not a parking for that. You certainly could if you wanted to, but I, I think most places don't charge for handicapped parking spaces, assuming that someone has a placard or a plate. But I have to look to verify the, the ordinance or state law behind that. But I think that would really be the council's decision. Thank you. Okay. Certainly something we can look into if y'all would like us to. Uh, I just had not heard that. I just assumed that if you were parking in a space, you <laughs> paid. I... Yeah. So, yeah, we, we'll look into it and come back with more information, see if we can see what other organizations are doing and if there are any state regulations re regarding that. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think this is where I was. Right. Yeah. So, um, that really is it on the managed inventory. Um, and this last page does have our real inventory, the actual physical locations of the, the meters and the permits. So um, are there any questions, guidance that y'all want to provide on how we move forward with this? Our intention is to take this information and then have a community Q&A and kind of soft sale start of permits, uh, sales to the public. Um, but before we get there, we wanted to make sure we came to council and got any input that we need to have. At what point are we have are we voting on these are the rates? You'll vote in December. Okay. Well, well I'll, ask you, I'll ask that you vote in December. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, in my meeting, I expressed that you know, with if the lot, sorry, if the parking deck is eighty dollars a permit and the cross the street is twenty five dollars a permit, it just that doesn't, to me, that the divergence in amounts seems to be too much mm -hmm. because I'm just like, unless you really want to have it in the deck, why would you not go across the street? Um, so it seems to me that those two amounts need to be closer um, than they are. I don't know what to suggest, uh, whether it's lower the deck or raise the um, dogwood lot once, but, but then again, maybe there's some economic thing going on in the background you're trying to push people to dogwood the only reason i say that is the goal is for dogwood to go away eventually and put a park there so those spaces are going to disappear um and 
But my comment is it seems to me because the two are right across the street from each other, that's an odd mix. <clears throat> I mean, I would agree that the deck does seem very high compared to, I mean, I know it's covered, but I feel like it being covered is really the only thing that's selling it. Um, but I would say I would not be in favor of raising the $25 permit because that's for employees and residents. And I feel like especially as we're rolling this out, it's important for us to have something to be able to offer the residents and the employees. I do think we're gonna have to look at other places that we could put employees, because um, I know I've heard from several of them that work on the other side of Main Street that that's a long way to walk at 1130 at night. Um, and the fact that it will eventually be a park. So I don't, I, other than I feel like the deck does seem a little high. Um, I think you guys have done a really good job of putting this Tetris puzzle together because I don't know how you kept that straight, but. Um. One thing to keep in mind on the deck permits and the permit structures in general is this is really as low as we comfortably could go on the numbers from a, a revenue perspective to support mm. the cost of building the new deck. So that means if you take $5 off of one, you need to add $5 to another one. Or some numbers. sort of comparison. No, no, that's fine. That's part of the 10 year model that was presented, I guess, way back when we started the parking deck discussions was, you know, permit costs were going to increase over time. Um, so we're, we're really, you know, at a starting point here. Um, you know, we can, we can always start lower if that's the council's prerogative, and we can see where revenues come in and go from there. Um, but yeah, this was from a forecast perspective. We don't have any actual data to gauge this off of. That was where we were building it. <clears throat> there is free parking also, mm -hmm. right? It's that's correct. roughly a block and a half to mm -hmm. two blocks away. Yep. So we're talking about like a tenth of a mile walk for people? Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, and the one thing we felt was advantageous about the Dogwood lot being able to provide an employee type permit was you do have really secure structured infrastructure well lit mm -hmm. on Main Street that you can travel the length of and f we're making improvements on 4th and 5th that would help you know you get to one location that's a well lit strong piece of infrastructure that you're not you know walking to some dark lot so yeah. that was part of the thought process behind Dogwood being an employee lot um, and in the future if we do have additional resources right the goal is that this parking fund is able to make well-lit, safe infrastructure projects for the community to use. Are, do we have cameras in all of our downtown parking lots? That's a good we, question. We do not. We do, we not, do not currently. We are, we're exploring cameras. Uh, the chief, one of the things the chief and the police department work on is cameras um, around downtown in general. Okay. Mm -hmm. The deck will have I know have that's cameras. an increasingly... Yeah common issue of people's cars being broken into Ingalls parking lots constantly is happening and I guess Ingalls doesn't actually have cameras in their parking lots <clears throat> which is bizarre to me but if I think we should have them if sure. we don't so yeah definitely something we can look into and that whole area with the parking deck being built and the public restrooms you know more cameras are being put in these government facilities so mm -hmm. yeah we can look at the parking lots as well I, mean, I also feel like we've reached a point where it's time to throw it out to the masses. This is good. Let's see what they think. It's possible we have an $80 permit and nobody wants to buy it. And so then maybe we do look at lowering it a little bit. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's certainly something like we can adjust as we go. The whole parking management system really is something that we can tweak and work with as we're working our way through it. I have a question on the, the, all the lots, all the permit types. And that is, anybody can buy any of these permits. That's correct. Right. I mean, I know we have it listed as employee and resident, but anybody that wanted to buy one could buy one if yeah, there are that, enough available. That's true, unless, you know, if the council is so directed, we could work on ways that probably would be difficult to find out how to securely understand if someone is an employee of downtown or resident. But if council directed to do so, we could certainly explore that. To make sure it is is only used for those purposes and these permits are basically attached to a license plate uh, that's correct 
Right, so you're not hanging anything in the window? Nope. With, I mean, we'll talk a little bit about the deck, but yeah. I know we're going to talk about that, yeah, but yeah. that's, it's not like we're sending out things each year. Nope, right. it's just all managed online. You enter your car, your vehicle plate, you're good. And on the permits, can you buy them per month? They're listed as per month, or is yes, it a year we, commitment? it's a per month. Okay. I mean, I feel like we need to find out some way to regulate the resident employee permit. That's why it's so inexpensive was to make it a benefit. But the only way I can think to do it is to put it on the businesses themselves because it's not my, it's not our job to confirm that someone works in downtown, but if a business buys whatever, five of them. The, the problem though when the business buying five them, of them is it's attached to a license plate. Somebody's gotta enter that license plate. In oh, I know, but it's on to the business owners to collect the license plates and if somebody quits then to say that license plate doesn't count anymore. From an enforcement perspective, I think it's also beneficial for us to understand who that employee is if they have been abusing the system, you know, to be able to collect, you know, past due invoices mm -hmm. or penalties. It is, it is ideal for us to have it attached to the person rather than the business. Um, but there probably are some creative ways we can look at how to verify uh, downtown employment or residency. I don't know. What do you think? Well, I think you could still have it tied to the individual. It's just maybe it's a different form that the business submits and they're like, okay, I'm going to get five. Here's the five people on the five license plates. And then if that person leaves, I need to do a change form. So like we'll have to look at if, it. If it is, it's, it's, we'll it's, it's going to be an interesting management challenge. To yeah. do. I mean, the idea is we want to provide that option for employee and residents, but the truth is it may just be very hard to you know we may have somebody that comes downtown well I, for whatever reason somebody that comes downtown yeah, it may really it's you're hoping to create like an economic market of yeah. different valued assets right so there will be people who want to park in the covered parking deck and have easy access and not have to worry about dealing with an uncovered lot so it's really you know that's further away so really we're pricing it and trying to develop it from an economic sense of what's the most valuable asset and hopefully react to how the people react to these this kind of new model. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we, we'll look into it if that's the direction of council. I don't think we have to figure it out today, um, but something we can look into and see if it's uh, something we can effectively take care of. I'm not completely interested in doing that, to be honest. Just I think it's a lot to micromanage and I don't think we need to be doing that and I think the employee benefit already of having a $25 a month. I mean, there's no other city in North Carolina where downtown employees can get a parking pass that cheap. Mm -hmm. um, that is also lit on sidewalks and secure. So I, I, I just would leave it to people <coughs> to buy their own parking passes. Is that like... I, don't, I agree with you. I don't know how you possibly, especially with it being online and nobody gets a little thing to put in their window. Mm -hmm. Somebody gets online, they want to buy one, they buy one, even if they're visiting from California for a month. Yeah. I don't know how you stop that. Yeah. I was just saying that one, one thing we can do, if y'all would like, is whenever we have the permits that are available for purchase, we can put those out initially, one to people who already currently have permits, and then when those are filled, we can send that out to our business list downtown to give that first right for businesses to get that out to their employees. That seems the most efficient way to kind of start that off if that's um, what we'd like to do. And then <clears throat> maybe when we see what the, um, the quantity is left after that, that might be a way we can kind of determine next steps in that way. Well, I guess that brings up a point. Once again, I, I don't have an answer and I don't think there is an answer, but you know, if you were to buy an e-lot permit, you basically hold that permit as long as you pay your 25 or 35 or $40, you hold that permit in perpetuity for that license. Can you switch a license plate and keep the permit? Ooh. Right. So you kind of own it in perpetuity until you don't pay, right? Cause you get first dibs for the next month. Mm -hmm. That's how it would be currently. So who on the waiting list doesn't get one until somebody doesn't pay their fees for a month? That's how the current. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know how you do it otherwise. Yeah, it would, it would be a, a full-time, couple full-time jobs probably to keep up with 
uh, just keeping up with employees yeah. downtown if we were to do that. Mm -hmm. the secondary market, this is going to happen. It's just economics. <laughs> okay. Any other questions or comments? All right. So we'll move forward and uh, bring this out to uh, the community and, and talk through some Q&As with this. A um, couple other quick updates. Uh, so the parking deck is on schedule for substantial completion in January. Uh, February will be the final cleaning, and you know sometime between there and March would be the, the opening of the deck. Um, so the deck will work for daily parkers. Um, essentially, you would drive up, pull the ticket, enter and park in the deck. Your first hour is free, so if you go to exit with your ticket within that hour, the gate will open and you're free to go. Uh, and then it's $1.50 per hour after that with a $10 max. You, there's three options to pay. You can pay at the exit, so you can pull up to the, the gate, submit your ticket, submit your card, cash, coin, uh, and exit, or you can pay on foot. There'll be a couple on-foot kiosks available, so if you wanna go ahead and get your ticket validated prior to going back to your car and pulling out, you can do that as well. Uh, that's going to be also cash, coin, and card. Uh, and then we'll also have park mobile options to validate that ticket, and so you could leave the deck. Um, we will be asking council to adopt a lost ticket fee in this process, and that will be managed through dispatch. They can essentially push an invoice uh, to the person who's lost their ticket at the gate and let them out, and then that will go into our collection system. Uh, and then also, if someone is really, really, you know, irate and they can't figure this out, dispatch does have the capacity to kind of vend the gate and let someone uh, free without payment. But we will not want to do that. Oh no! So <laughs> I know that. We, so we have a way that somebody can just lift the gate. Yeah, yeah, yeah we can just lift it if it's the Smith uh, family needed that in the Azores. Finally, the lady said she just opened a gate. And, could not figure out how to work out. <laughs> <laughs> We're trying to get out for free. Finally, the lady came over and said, get in the car, let's go. There's some sort of cost benefit, right? Yes. The amount of time that you're talking to the Smiths and the amount of time it takes to lift that arm. <laughs> um, and then the uh, $10 per day will reset at some point during the evening. So, uh, you know, you can't just park in there for four days straight and only pay $10 to exit. You'll pay $10 per day that you're in there. So... Um, and then lastly, permit holders using the deck, uh, that $80 per month permit, they will be provided a puck, uh, like you would see for like uh, some of the um, like fast passes for toll roads, and you would just have that in your dash, you pull up, the gate opens, and you're, you're free to you know, go in and out of the deck as you please. And that puck has special technology in it that you can't just pass it back to somebody else. It will recognize that it's already come through and knows that the vehicle needs to come back out and those types of things. So uh, really good technology these days uh, with parking. But that could be used if you had multiple cars, you could, depending you on could which car you could change your car, yeah, that's correct. It's not like the uh, license plate. Yeah, and it's not one of those, you know, the other option was a, a, like a sticker that you would put yeah. and we opted to go with the more like the velcro attached puck so for that one then you've got to show up city hall and get your puck that's correct so we don't mail it to them uh i don't think so no okay and then when you don't make pay your fee your puck is is we can is, disable it yeah right okay questions on the deck well this is not the deck but can you are you paying for your parking, this is the deck, in the deck? Yes. Or can you also pay for that parking on Park Mobile? You can pay for it on Park Mobile as well. That's one okay. of the three options. Then when we start talking about Park Mobile app, I have some questions. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get there after. Next slide after enforcement. Um, so a couple of things to highlight on enforcement. We're going to make sure we're doing a lot of communication on this. Uh, so it's all paid by license plate, right? Um, and we are going to promote Park Mobile heavily because it makes it a lot easier. Uh, there is no backing into spaces. If you park the wrong way on Main Street or back in or back into a parking lot space in a surface lot, you will be ticketed for backing into that space because we cannot read your plate. Um, so that is going to be very clear, and we're going to make sure that that is signed and in our parking lots and available so folks know uh, do not back into a parking space. Unless you have another state's driver's license per thing on your. On the yes. Front. But there's no way to, I mean, 
For North Carolinians, you can't back in. Sure. Yeah, I think that's fair. Um, always checking in. So no matter what, you need to check in at a kiosk or on Park Mobile. Even if you're just there for the first 30 minutes free, you still need to log your vehicle that you're there because there is capacity that you might pass the 30 minutes free, and then you would need to pay for that space. Um, and it makes it so our enforcement can drive by and know that you've checked in at the meter or on Park Mobile, and they won't give you a ticket, so that will also be communicated and signed. And then there's also no double parking uh, for permits, so you cannot buy a permit and put you and your two other friends' vehicles on the permit and all come park downtown at the same time. Uh, the system will recognize the first vehicle. It will say, yes, that vehicle has paid for a permit, but once it comes across the second vehicle, it will flag it as double parked, and uh, they will get a ticket for double parking on the permit. Yeah, so just for those, right, you get to put two licenses on a permit. That's correct. Right, two plates. Yeah. So that can't be abused with this current system. Uh, the enforcement hours are changing from, uh, proposed to change from 9 a.m. to 7 p.m. in the lots and the meters on Main Street and the avenues. Uh, the deck is 24 hours enforcement. Um, we will be implementing boot and tow options for enforcement for habitual offenders. We'll have some changes to the violation fees to make it kind of a more reasonable time frame before the cost gets too escalated on the individual and gives them efficient time to come in and pay that fee. Uh, and lastly, we'll be adding a lost ticket fee and we're gonna go with a warning first approach to this enforcement because it's gonna be brand new and we want someone's experience to be, you know, I backed in. I didn't read the sign. That's very reasonable uh, that someone might do that. So we want to be more educational out of the gate. But if it's a second time offender, you will get a violation. Any questions on enforcement? Okay. And so lastly, I'm just going to go ahead and let Jamie talk about Park Mobile. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk so nice. about the app. I'm going to start off by saying that my meeting with Park Mobile to answer all of our questions is Friday. So any questions oh. from today that I cannot answer for you, I will get those written down and we will ask them on Friday. Um, so this is just the advertisement for everyone here, everyone in the room, everyone on the call, to please download the Park Mobile app and put your car tags in it. Go ahead and download it now. And if you're parking in our lots, go ahead and start using that. Get familiar with it. Um, it's a pretty intuitive uh, app once you get used to it. Even our privately owned lots that are not city lots, most of them use Park Mobile as well, um, which has been helpful. Um, when we're meeting with Park Mobile, we're talking to them about uh, some promotions to get more people to download the app at some of our events coming up this fall. Um, they have just some abilities where if you download the app at a special event, you might get a special prize or a special discount on parking for a couple dollars off, things like that. Um, with Park Mobile, it allows you to pay anywhere. Um, so you can just check in. What you'll do is you'll go into a metered space, whether it's in the lot or on Main Street or in the avenues, and you'll check in on Park Mobile. And then you can put in the amount of time you're planning to be there. And then if you're out and having dinner somewhere and you want to stay for longer and enjoy downtown for a little longer, you can extend that time from that Park Mobile app. Um, there's also some options for parking validation for businesses to do that. Uh, I don't have a lot of answers on how that works yet, but we're finding that out. Um, that's pretty much it as far as how Park Mobile works. Uh, if there was any specific questions. I'll hold mine to you going to talk about them on Friday. I'll, I will not ask them again. <laughs> I've got them written down, um, and so we'll be able to have some updates on the specific logistics on it for that. There were just some questions on um, the amount of time, because currently it's um, two-hour minimum in our lots, I believe. Yeah, two-hour minimum, and so that's something that with the new format that we've already proposed with the half-hour free and the hour free in the lots, we want to make sure that's all worked out for um, the new lots for that. So that's that's one thing that we're definitely going to talk to them about on Friday. Any other questions on Park Mobile? Okay. Danny? So really, uh, just in summary, wrapping up, um, we will have meter and hourly parking on the Main Street and avenues. Uh, those meters 
uh, will be on your September 1st agenda for approval. They came in under budget, and we have a uh, price guarantee on additional meters uh, for a year. So if we find that we do need to install additional meters, it's as simple as contacting the provider and adding those to different areas of the city if we find we need them. Uh, that will be $2 per hour on Main Street and the avenues with the first half hour free. And then within the surface lots, $1.50 per hour uh, with a $10 max, same as the parking deck. The monthly permits we've covered, and we've also covered enforcement. Uh, we will be maintaining dedicated loading zones and 30-minute zones. Uh, we looked at the citizen discount and felt it was not financially feasible for the parking management system because essentially what we what we found was we would probably end up just taxing the citizens on the back end to make up the lost revenue. Um, so uh, we're going to move forward with just promotions um, at this point, um, and we'll also have permit options available. Um, <clears throat> and so lastly, we'll be placing the kiosks on Main Street and the avenues after September 1st, uh, potential approval of that contract. Uh, we're finishing up the deck uh, system RFP, so that will probably come to you all uh, at mid-month in September. And uh, lastly, we want to make sure we have our stakeholder Q&A meeting uh, before we come to you all with a final proposal for our rates and fees. And with that, uh, that's uh, your last update till December. Any questions? I yes. have a question. We, I think, all received an email about um, a towing situation downtown, maybe labeled as predatory towing. And so I was just wondering, is it, um, do we, when we tow a car, do we use a private towing company? We do use a private towing company. We don't have a public service. And do we know if these companies accept cash only or credit? I'm turn to the chief. So while the chief's come, he can talk about current practices, but after we got the email today, um, it was forwarded to me by Council Member Hensley. Um, we think, um, Ms. Speaker and the chief and I had an email exchange today, we think we can regulate um, by ordinance how towing occurs in the city on public and private, um, on public and private property as it relates to posting of signs, um, acceptance of payment um there were several things that i think Ms. beaker found that we could we could look at um that we would have to do it by ordinance that other um, there's several court cases relate or at least one court case related to this so um and i don't know if the chief has anything about but currently um i don't know how we do it um by the rotation wrecker yeah, yeah. currently so we we had a discussion about not with the issue that you uh asked about but we had another uh, car vehicle that was towed and so we had a discussion about you know is there an unlimited amount that someone could charge and mm -hmm. I think what Angie bring you know brought up is that we can't regulate how much a private property owner can charge so currently right now what we do when we tow we call the next rotation wrecker I would think maybe Angie we could regulate that because we could say if you want to be part of our next rotation process you can only charge a maximum of this because they could they could elect to not be part of that system and and as long as that's legal and that would be angie's decision but i think we as a city we would maybe want to do that mm -hmm. but as with respect to private properties we can regulate the signage how big what it looks like the lettering all that sort of stuff uh, we just can't we can't stipulate how much they charge for that and so uh, it would really be Parker beware, I guess. Yeah. I hope that some of our private parking folks downstairs or like downtown also <clears throat> wouldn't take part in practices like that. Um, I like the idea of limiting how much they can charge. $225 for a tow bill that is cash only sounds like a pretty lucrative business. And it doesn't seem very fair, maybe unethical. And so I just, I want to make sure that we're protecting our residents and visitors from situations like that. Yeah, I agree. It certainly doesn't seem fair. That seemed like a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, I just don't, uh, again, Angie can weigh in, but I just don't think we can regulate what a private property right. charges. We can regulate how they accept payment mm -hmm. and different things, but 
you know, it, I, you know, I feel bad for the person who gets a two hundred twenty-five dollar right. cash or charge bill, and then. And we can choose what towing companies we choose to do business with, though. So we, we can, can in that yes. aspect, right? Yeah. So a company now, if they want to be on the next rotation, they apply to us. We basically inspect them to make sure that they meet our criteria, and we do that on a, on a regular basis, re-inspect okay. them. So we can approve or deny any tow company, and and we can remove them if we have complaints or reason to do that. I mean, there's, there's no... Uh, you know, we don't have to have anybody on our rotation record mm -hmm. if we if we don't want to. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Any questions? All right. All right. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Okay. Uh, next item of new business <clears throat> we will move to. Uh, Fire Station 1 and Edwards Park guaranteed maximum price. Mr. Murr. Good afternoon, Mayor, members of the City Council. Um, I don't have a presentation on this item today. It should be relatively quick. Um, we have been provided the guaranteed maximum price from Edifice for both the Fire Station 1 and Edwards Park construction. So um, that amount is $14,758 thousand and forty two dollars so um, this you know GMP follows discussions with edifice on developing a 50-year uh, minimum facility for the Hendersonville Fire Department and improving not only the accessibility and amenities of the mini golf facility but also honoring our history and tradition here in Hendersonville so um, some of the items that are included in the fire station one and GMP that I did want to make a note of there are three hundred and three thousand dollars approximately for uh, sustainability items which include a uh, turnkey pv system uh, rainwater collection and permeable papers so uh, this project is not going to be lead certified but we certainly have some of the amenities that um, the lead certification would require um, and, and pv is solar panels for Yes, PV is photovoltaic solar panels. <coughs> um, next up, the uh, construction timeline. So our current estimated notice to proceed date, uh, which is when we would start construction slash demolition, is December 2nd, 2022. So just a few months away. Um, our estimated substantial completion is in January 2024. Uh, with the facility being finally completed in January, February of 2024. And that timeline can be expedited just a bit, um, pending some actions that we need to take as staff on the temporary fire facility uh, that's being installed at Fire Station 2 currently. You're talking about the fire station completion schedule now, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. <clears throat> Is that what the little things are at Station 2 now? Like the yeah. trailer? Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or the modular units, I guess. Mm. I should call them. Excuse me. I have done that. I am so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I really, I, yeah. They won't be in there long. Um, and then finally, I, I wanted to provide some positive news. So we've been working uh, with our financing team and um, Council will consider the approval of uh, the installment financing at the September 1st meeting. Um, but we did receive uh, news that we um, had the option to select a 20 year loan at a 2.99% rate, uh, which is very competitive in the current market. Um, so that is a private debt issuance. Um, the, the alternative for the city of Hendersonville would have been a public market issuance and that rate would have been 3.45 percent over 20 years and uh, the difference between those two is a savings of about nine hundred and fifty one thousand dollars so um, we felt that we were doing right by the taxpayers and i just wanted to highlight that there is significant savings um, in the financing method selected does that mean that we have found a lender or does that mean they have authorized us to be able to go out and find someone that will do that we um, have received bank bids and okay. um, yes we're, we're working with a lender yep. so gotcha. 
Uh, next step is to go to the LGC to give us approval to actually get the loan. Mm -hmm. um, so we're, we're, we've notified the bank um, that we're willing to work with them at the rate um, that was bid. Hopefully the Fed does not meet between that time and we do our bid. Yeah, September <laughs> September 22nd, Ho hopefully not. I think uh, you know, by, going through, by going through the bid process, they, they'll hold that bid until so many days. So we should be, good. even if the Fed raises their rate, we should be in pretty good shape, I think. Um, I think we'll see if they'll, they'll have to hold the rate. Um, and we're LGC. And, you know, even though the cost of the project went up, I don't want to jump ahead. You may want to say this, Adam. Um, You're good, John. Um, this is what makes me nervous, you know, made me nervous is even though the price of the project went up based on our forecasting and the conservative model that we use, um, thanks to Brian and Adam, um, the financing cost will, is actually lower than what we projected in budget forecast. So we're still, um, even though the cost of the project went up and it includes Edwards and the fire trucks and those kind of things, um, as it relates to our financial model looking years out, it's actually going to be less than what we projected as we show you during budget. So um, we're not we're not blowing the budget model. So, so we think that's positive. Too. So. This question is a bit in the weeds, but um, just for people that are listening. So the fire station we're projecting will be completed in January 2024, but Edwards Park would be completed before that. Mm. Yes, that is correct. Yes. I'll let Brian's working with the. I've got the timeline. What's what's the Edwards Park? Yes, that's. I know someone's going to ask. That's, gonna that's ask correct. Me. The um, the Edwards Park uh, demolition and site work will begin in October, and the miniature golf installation will be in January and February on our current schedule, um, and then from there uh, we have additional landscaping, playground installation, and they'll start building the actual con new concessions building and restroom post uh, miniature golf. I think the substantial completion is estimated for August of 23. That means, but people can play putt-putt starting in May. I do not think we'll allow folks no, out there. will be a construction site. will be actually site, a construction so. site. We, will, wow. we are so going to be Next summer we will not have a putt-putt course. Not until August. August is still summer. No other way to do it. It's going to be so good when it's done. It's going to be great. I know our, I think our construction uh, contractor principal is on the call, so he heard the urgency and the importance of that amenity, so he'll, uh, he'll have his team working really hard. Well, I, I will just reiterate that in discussing this all along, the goal was there would be no loss of use of putt-putt, mm -hmm. that it would come back Memorial Day like it normally does. So that would be wonderful if that would happen. Okay, how was that? All right. So, sorry, I had to open that can of worms, but I had to. No, it's a great <laughs> question. We need to know these things. We'll just roll in a mobile unit for the for the concessions. There we go. <laughs> so, Mayor and Council, that's uh, my presentation. If you have any other questions, any, any I'm other available. Questions? Uh, Mike Carlisto from Edifice is also online, although he is coming off a dentist appointment. So, oh boy, he, he might sound a little funny if you if you guys have questions. <laughs> any other questions? We do have a motion to uh, approve this. Anyone want to make that motion? Madam Mayor, I move that City Council adopt the resolution authorizing the City Manager to execute a contract amendment with Edifice LLC for a guaranteed maximum price not to exceed $14,758,042 and authorize the City Manager to make change orders for Fire Station 1 and Edwards Park Project number 19019 as presented. Is there any discussion? Not. Those in favor of the resolution say aye. Aye. Let's suppose say no. <clears throat> Ayes have it. Motion carries. Next step forward. All right. Uh, and finally, discussion regarding social districts. Mayor Volt, members of City Council, um, we, um, upon the request of Council Member Simpson, 
we added this item to your agenda to, um, and we believe we submitted some information to you. Uh, the legislature in the long session two years ago uh, enacted legislation that would allow local go or cities um, to establish social districts in downtown areas where folks could um, move from one establishment to another carrying alcoholic beverages. Um, and they be, that's, that was approved in the long session. Then in the short session, they also have updated that legislation to tweak it a little bit and, and clarify some things. Cities have started rolling out the idea of social districts um, in, the, in their communities um, close by. We know that um, at least Silva has done it, maybe Waynesville, I'm not sure, but definitely Silva. We, the chief has been in contact with folks in Hickory. I put a, some information. Hickory has been the closest to us, but um, looks like the best model um, as it relates to cities our size. Um, and basically, the city council um, would um, enact your own social district ordinances and plan. Um, you have the ability to dictate, as, as I understand it, um, hours, of, um, hours of operation. Um, uh, they have to have it, it has to be a marked cup. Um, businesses can opt in, opt out. Um, and there's, there's lots of logistics we would have to look look through, but also you could also designate the times of year. You, you could discontinue it during festivals um, and things like that. So the city would have lots of authority um, if you wanted to move forward with um, the, um, the social districts. And, and, and to go back to this, I think this actually started prior to that during the beginning of COVID, if I'm not mistaken, Jamie, as we were trying to help local <coughs> downtown businesses, um, the legislature allowed for um, more open carry um, to allow um, to support our businesses during COVID when they could not have folks inside their restaurants. So um, again, um, the city council has a, a lot of authority um, to do this and to regulate it. Um, it's very specific. Um, the league has a great um, white paper or a great, a great um, update that is included in your agenda packet um, if you wanted to look at that. Um, and so, um, but I think council member Simpson wanted to just have a discussion if there's something I don't want to speak for you. I'll be quiet in just a second. Um, see if council is interested in doing this. Um, if we, if, if they are, I think staff suggestion would be um, to take some time, um, look at the best practices, and, and maybe implement it as part of the the new year in, in 2023. But um, we'll stand by for guidance um, from the city council. Me? Yep. Okay. Um, so. When we first heard about the social districts, I was pretty intrigued by them. And I think that it's definitely something that would be worth us trying. I do think that there is a lot of misconception out there about what a social district is. But the more research I did, and it's particularly Hickory's um, program, I mean, honestly, I think we could just copy paste it because they've done a really good job. Um, I think it, it helps to regulate it. And I think if we were to try this, it's an opportunity for us to set the tone in downtown for something like this without it turning into, I guess, like a, I, I feel like when I say social district to some people, they just imagine Bourbon Street, and that's not at all what I imagine Hendersonville would be setting the tone for in this instance. Um, but it, you know, it gives us yet another opportunity for people to spend time outdoors and for us to keep the lively atmosphere. And dare I say, I guess the a younger residents might be looking for something like this. And so it's just another thing that we can offer to them. Um, I also think with the success of Rhythm and Brews, while it is a smaller scale because it's not all of downtown, that's kind of served as a test even on a grander scale than what this would be. Um, and I think we can also kind of dip our toes into it. So like just because we're doing it doesn't mean to, we need to make a big splash that it's happening. We figure out what the program's going to be and then we just open it up and it kind of organically would spread through the town through there. Um, but one of the big things that I liked about Hickory's program was for, you know, th they have the color coded window clings. So it's really easy for residents and visitors to understand, you know, where they could purchase something for the social district, what stores they could still bring their drink into and where 
you may have a store that they don't want anyone in there with a drink. Um, and so, one, it's good for residents to understand, and two, it's good for the businesses that don't want beverages or any sort of open container in their um, store. So anyways, I sent everybody an email, um, I think earlier this week, just to kind of gather some of your initial thoughts. I've had some good discussions um, with Chief my hand about it as well. And so I just figured the best way to start the discussion is to have a discussion about it. And so I'm curious what your all's thoughts would be in us pursuing this. I remember when we first started looking into open streets and I was on the phone with Chuck McGrady at like 1130 at night and he was like drafting a bill to allow for like a temporary relief of, you know, open containers in designated areas downtown. And so um, I think that the work that our legislators have done to modernize the alcohol laws in North Carolina has been amazing. And I think this sounds wonderful for the city. So I'm excited. I, I hope that we can. I hope we can do this. I think the another important part to reiterate is that it is very flexible for us, so mm -hmm. we can set the hours. If people were to abuse it, I mean, God forbid we put the time into it and people abuse it, but if they were, we could take it away. We could suspend it during festivals or when there's going to be extra large groups of people where it might be a little bit harder for our PD to, to maintain and sort of work that event. Um, and, you know, it also has the particular cups they have to have and so it's it it seems to me like the legislator spent a really long time and they put a lot of good work into figuring out those details to help make it mm -hmm. you know the best program it could be would this eventually um uh include seventh avenue i mean ideally i would like to see it include seventh avenue but i think since this is like a start and we're yes. i guess dipping our toes it's better to start with the one district mm -hmm. um and I think that our emergency services would agree with that. <laughs> I'd, as I indicated in your email, I am not convinced that this is appropriate. I just can't see people wandering the streets drinking alcohol. Um, I may be very old fashioned on that, but uh, um, I think of Hendersonville more as a family oriented place. Um, and just alcohol all up and down Main Street is not the, not my image of Hendersonville. Mm -hmm. I have a question that is, what problem does this fix? Like, what is the problem now that this law fixes? I mean, I don't know if there's necessarily a problem that it's fixing it's just giving folks another opportunity to socialize outside no no but i mean is it a i mean it does it happen a lot of oh, that people you're drinking your beer you're not finished you can't take it with you right this way you can get a cup take it with you is that a big deal are you talking about the actual north carolina general assembly law or are you talking about us potentially changing something in hendersonville because the North Carolina, the General Assembly law, I think, was geared to allow flexibility, especially once COVID started. And then it opened doors for um, areas and cities that had more breweries or cideries and people could move about to different locations. It would, you know, allow better service of business and just economic development in those areas. And so that's why they originally kind of changed the law was so that they could have more flexibility with these types of businesses in general. But as far as fixing something here, I don't know that that's, I don't But I, I guess. I think your question like, is it, the demand for it, right? Yeah, like I'm trying, what I'm trying to figure out is, even this one says, if I, what you just said, mm -hmm. if I have a beer mm -hmm. and I'm at Oklahoma and I want to go somewhere else, I can't walk in the door with that cup. Right. Correct. Right. So that's what I'm trying to figure out is, is this just people on the way out the door, they want to take their drink with them or, or and is that a big problem that people can't do that? Um, because I, I guess I agree. What is the demand for this? How, how how does this change? I mean, I know if you do it, change or at least I perceive what that is. But what is the 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 need that's not being met? I shouldn't have said problem. Yeah. What is the need that's not being met that this is trying to meet? Because if you if you have your drink from one establishment and you go to the next establishment and you can't take it in, 
that's what I don't understand. Because I guess my my understanding was you you have this cup and you just kind of walk around all night long with this cup, but that's not the case because you can't go into a different establishment with this cup. Right. I think right. it's about the in between your destinations, right? So if you're at Okawaha and your friends are ready to go because they want to go stop at some of the shops that are on their way to their next dinner, you know, dinner reservation at Shine, then this provides you the opportunity to do that. Now, with that being said, not every shop has to let you in with that cup. And you can't walk into Shine with it. Right. Yeah. Okay. Well, you have to consume or dispose of it. Right. You have to. I just can't see any advantage to the city to do this or really to the businesses. Now I have I spoken to Wine, Sage and Gourmet, Okawaha, um, Black Bear and a couple other businesses that have ABC permits and they seemed all in favor for it. I assume because it provides them yet another opportunity to sell someone something else. Well, yeah, I can see that you're selling someone a drink on their way out the door. Yep. So that they were never intending to drink it in the restaurant. They can drink it as they walk. But the, the only other thing I guess, and that is, so this is what I thought. If you're not parked in the district, the moment you step out of the district, you got to pour your cup out. You are supposed mm -hmm. to keep it yeah. in the district. Yes. Right. Well, as I said in my email, we'll be discussing this on September 27th. Yeah, I mean, I've, that's another reason why I wanted to bring it up now, because I think it provides another opportunity for us to hear from residents if they heard about it or if we wanted to bring it up or garner some sort of, you know, because I can think it would be a cool idea, but if everyone in the community doesn't want it, then I totally understand that. And, and currently, though, like if I'm sitting outside of Metzaluna, I can order an alcoholic beverage, correct? Yes. And they fixed the whole two beer thing I saw in that. But not everybody has, um, you know, an outdoor dining permit, so. Okay. Can I ask a question? And I can't get my, what's happening September 27th? What is? Yeah. Council conversation. Oh, you mean, so at your council conversation. That's what I told her in my email. I said, we will talk, we will discuss okay. this. I, I didn't, okay. <laughs> I wasn't, He's like, what are we doing on September twenty seventh? I wasn't privy. I, I, I wasn't. Feeling, you're like, wait a second. <laughs> I wasn't privy to that email. I was like, okay, what what's going on? Yeah, at my council so, conversation. So you want? Would you like that staff to add that to the agenda for that evening so everyone would have that? Oh, I mean, question. I, that's up to you guys. I, I I told her I would like to discuss this at my council conversation and get some feedback. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's your council conversation if you would like to talk about it or not. Um, I'm going to be adding parking to mine as well, which I'm sure it's probably on or on there. But, um, <laughs> yeah, I wasn't trying to, I was just saying, I told her, and I look forward to talking about this at my council conversation. And I think this, for me, was more about starting the conversation, right? There's a lot, if we did decide to move forward with it, there's a lot that needs to be worked out. And so I would just... I wanted to make sure that we could start the conversation internally with ourselves, but then also with the community. I know you can do it in Greensboro. Because mm -hmm. my daughter told me all about it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the reason why I asked you about 7th Avenue, because there's a lot of breweries and right. distilleries. Yep. I mean, the other thing I thought, too, was if we did it, we would limit it to beer and wine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think it just increases potential for... <clears throat> these businesses again um, as well so I guess I just don't see that it would be in an advantage to the city to have people mm -hmm. carrying alcohol up and down the street well I mean and, also, and, you know, how do we know that they don't COVID already? was different <laughs> COVID was different yeah. and we're not in that situation anymore I'm going to, um, Chief, if I may ask you, and I'm not trying to put you on the spot. If you don't know the answer, that's fine. How often do we run into problems with people carrying open alcoholic beverages on Main Street? Do we write many tickets about that? that? We, we do see that on occasion. Uh, most of the ABC establishments are really good about keeping people uh, from leaving their establishment with an open, you know, because most of them are glass, and so they, they don't let them go. I will say that when Lindsay brought this up, you know, my first reaction is to sort of cringe as the chief. I, I'm not real 
a big fan of alcohol on the streets. I did talk to several police chiefs that have this in their cities, and they're, they, none of them have had it for even a year yet, so it's still a fairly new thing, and they don't report any significant increase in problems that they have seen. Uh, I will say a couple of things that, that may be different for us, depending on the size that Let's assume council said we're going to do this. The size that you designate for that area for us is potentially much larger than any of the other cities, maybe rivaling what the area that Raleigh has just because 6th or 7th Avenue down to Caswell or, you know, the up to the avenues, you know, or up to church. That's a large area that you could do. And if you added 7th Avenue, uh, we could have a much larger area. So um, every one of the chiefs that I talk to, they do staff someone for the purpose of monitoring, you know, an officer to monitor that area. I don't have that right now. I don't have a, enough personnel to staff to do that. So that's a, maybe another consideration that council would need to think about. Uh, but they're not reporting a, a lot of problems. And I thought maybe I could tell Lindsay, this is a terrible idea. I can't support this at all, but I don't, there's, the evidence doesn't show that it is, that it causes a lot of problems. It may not be the atmosphere that the city of Hendersonville wants, and, you know, and of course, we would support whatever the council decides to do on that. And I'm sure your, uh, the residents would, would really ex, you know, express to you how they feel about it. But, um, but there's, you know, there's a lot of stuff that, that regulates how you do it. I think Hickory was what, what I saw to be probably the, the best model for a success in, in, you know, for a city to do this. Um, so if you wanted to do it, we would make it happen, of course. Um, but I think... You, and I think what the chief said is that the ideal, if you, if you, if you if we did go this route, uh, we currently have one downtown officer that really is splitting time um, supervising some other folks as it relates to SRO, if I'm not mistaken, chief, that's correct. And so, right. and so we would definitely want to um, add at least another um, downtown officer that we would, so we'd have two to split the, 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 <clears throat> the, yeah, time, I mean, the I, number I, of hours that we have during the week. Yeah, I mean, I think ideally, you know, I would want, you know, two to just be dedicated to this because one person couldn't even cover all seven days of the week, you know. So, um, but, you know, there's a lot of ways that we can figure out how we would want to do that if that's something we want. But we just, we currently don't have a, the, the people to do that. So right now I'm, I'm flexing my downtown officer who does additional duties and bringing officers in on overtime on occasion, particularly on Friday nights because I'm going down there. It's just it's just busy you know during the summertime there's so many people out and about at restaurants and i don't like having that many people downtown with not a dedicated presence down there so if we added this element of open containers on the street i would highly recommend that we have a person or persons dedicated solely to this purpose and our district would be if we did the main street district would be larger than the other ones you've looked at it's case, physical, like considerably larger. Yeah, considerably larger. I mean, it's, assuming if you went from even just say Sixth Avenue all the way to Caswell and from Church to King, I mean that's ten blocks plus the the sides, you know, the avenues. I mean that's that's a considerable distance. It's much larger than Hickory or Salisbury or Monroe. Those are the ones I talk to. So it's you know they they have a much smaller confined maybe a two or three block area. I have a question about the downtown officer. So the reason you, the reason that you originally started flexing that downtown officer was because of staffing shortages. Is that right? No, he, you know, that, that position has historically been, it's been different ranks. Currently right now I have a sergeant doing that. And, and so he, he is the, he supervises the SROs as well. Okay. So it is, since I've been here and well, before I got here, it was sort of a daytime position a Monday through Friday position. So that left every evening and weekends uncovered for a dedicated person. Uh, and, you know, my wife and I happened to be downtown on a Friday night, and I'm just thinking, man, there's a, it was a great atmosphere, but there was just so many people downtown that uh, I felt, you know, that it would be best if we had someone dedicated, you know, from 5 to 10 p.m. or something just for issues that pop up if anybody needed help. And, you know, with we're at full staff right now. I think we have one opening on the police side, so it's not a shortage issue. It's just, it's just a capacity issue. We we really weren't. Uh, there's just not enough personnel design. You know, he works 40 hours a week. He can't cover, you know, the 100 and. 
10, 120 hours of business life downtown. But wait, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm confused. But so he's doing other jobs too, but then we, there isn't a capacity. F I, so don't we already need another officer? Is that what you're, because that seems like what you're saying. Is right well, now he's already at capacity. Yeah, so right now he, I, he's over. busy. He's busy. I have him doing a lot of different things, but uh, he, I think he does a good job downtown in, in maintaining liaison with business owners primarily mm -hmm. uh, and interacting, but he's not down there as an ambassador as, as much as me, you know, we might like. So if you wanted more coverage downtown, yes, I, I don't have enough personnel to do that at this point. But I don't have a lot of complaints that we're not meeting business owners' needs either. I think mm -hmm. he's, Garrett has done a, a phenomenal job at that. So, uh, you know, that would not, at this point, not a, a priority need for me. Or I would have, you know, we would have talked about that in the budget. But if you want to do this, I would say, you know, we'll, we'll support it, of course, but I would really need the, the support of personnel to be able to, to manage this function. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chief. Anyone else have comments? If not, this discussion will continue. All right. So, uh, we so Madam Mayor, one yes. clarification. Okay. So what I've heard is we, we want to add, is, is it by consensus that everybody wants to have this discussion during your um, council conversations you want us to put it on the agenda just to bring it up as an idea or you can t let us know later I know we'll add it to mm -hmm. council member Smith's so I think it would be worthwhile getting people from across the yep. community okay okay and I also think like this is incredibly helpful mm -hmm. because this answers a lot of the questions that I sent to you today like so that we're kind of clear on, what, on what it is yeah and also like you know what does this mean you know mm -hmm. it answers the question i'm assuming this is all patterned after the state law so mm -hmm. yes. so i don't need to go look up a statute it's right there yeah yep. and, and i there may be other models but i think the chief would tell you that this is the best that we found at this point um, and, and hickory would be similar to us um, in some in many ways but yeah. okay uh, well never mind that's the answer question but i'll ask that one later <laughs> Well, thank you for starting the discussion, everybody. Okay. All right, if there's nothing else with that, we do have a closed session. If someone would like to make the motion to enter closed session, please. I'll read it. <clears throat> Madam Mayor, I move the City Council enter closed session pursuant to North Carolina General, General Statute 143-318-11A1 and 6. To prevent the disclosure of information that is privileged or confidential pursuant to the law of the state or of the United States, or not considered a public record within the meaning of Chapter 132 of the General Statutes, and to consider the qualifications, competence, performance, and character, fitness conditions of an individual public officer. Is there any discussion? Not those in favor of entering closed session say aye. 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 As opposed to say no. 